Next, you go into more specific details on how you can actually get rich and how you can't get rich. The first point was about how you're not going to get rich. You're not going to get rich renting out your time. You must own equity, a piece of a business, to gain your financial freedom. This is probably one of the absolute most important points. People seem to think that you can create wealth and make money through work, and it's probably not going to work. There are many reasons for that, but the most basic is just that your inputs are very closely tied to your outputs. In almost any salaried job, even one that's paying a lot per hour, like a lawyer or a doctor, you're still putting in the hours and every hour you get paid. So what that means is when you're sleeping, you're not earning. When you're retired, you're not earning. When you're on vacation, you're not earning. And you can't earn non-linearly. If you look at even doctors who get rich, like really rich, it's because they open a business. They open like a private practice and that private practice builds a brand and that brand attracts people or they build some kind of a medical device or a procedure or a process where they have intellectual property. So essentially, you're working for somebody else. And that person is taking on the risk and has the accountability and the intellectual property and the brand. So they're just not going to pay you enough. They're going to pay you the bare minimum that they have to to get you to do the job. And that can be a high bare minimum, but it's still not going to be true wealth where you're retired. And then finally, you're actually just not even creating that much original for society. Like I said, this tweet storm should have been called How to Create Wealth. It's just How to Get Rich was a more catchy title. But you're not creating new things for society. You're just doing things over and over. And you're essentially replaceable because you're now doing a set role. Most set roles can be taught. If they can be taught like in a school, then eventually you're going to be competing with someone who's got more recent knowledge, who's been taught and is coming in to replace you. You're much more likely to be doing a job that can be eventually replaced by a robot or by an AI. And it doesn't even have to be wholesale replaced overnight. It can be replaced a little bit of a time and that eats into your wealth creation and therefore your earning capability. So fundamentally, your inputs are matched to your outputs, you are replaceable, and you're not being creative. I just don't think that that is a way that you can truly make money. So everybody who really makes money at some point owns a piece of a product or a business or some kind of IP. That can be through stock options. So if you can be working at a tech company, that's a fine way to start. But usually the real wealth is created by starting your own companies or by, you know, even investors, they're in an investment firm and they're buying equity. So these are much more the routes to wealth. It doesn't come to the hours. You really just want a job or a career or a profession where your inputs don't match your outputs. So if you look at modern society, I get into this later in the tweet storm, businesses that have high creativity and high leverage tend to be ones where You could do an hour of work and it can have a huge effect, or you can do a thousand hours of work and it can have no effect. For example, look at software engineering. One great engineer can, for example, create Bitcoin and create billions of dollars worth of value. Uh, An engineer who's working on the wrong thing or not quite as good or just not as creative or thoughtful or whatever can work for an entire year. And every piece of code they ship ends up not getting used. Customers don't want it. That is an example of a profession where the input and the outputs are highly disconnected. It's not based on the number of hours that you put in. Whereas on the extreme other end, if you're a lumberjack, even the best lumberjack in the world, assuming they're not working with tools, the inputs and outputs are pretty connected. They're just using an axe or a saw. The best lumberjack in the world may be like 3x better than one of the worst lumberjacks, right? It's not going to be a gigantic difference. So you want to look for professions and careers where the inputs and the outputs are highly disconnected. This is another way of saying that you want to look for things that are leveraged. And by leverage, I don't mean financial leverage alone, like Wall Street uses, and that has a bad name. I'm just talking about tools. We're using tools. Computer is a tool that software engineers use. If I'm a lumberjack with bulldozers and automatic robot axes and saws, I'm going to be using tools and have more leverage than someone who's just using his bare hands and trying to rip the trees out by their roots. Tools and leverage are what create this disconnection between inputs and outputs. Creativity, so the higher the creativity component of a profession, the more likely it is to have disconnected inputs and outputs. So I think that if you're looking at professions where your inputs and your outputs are highly connected, it's going to be very, very, very hard to create wealth and make wealth for yourself in that process. Any other big things you should avoid other than renting out your time? Yeah, there are two tweets that I put out that are related. So the first one I was talking about, we were talking about like how your lifestyle you know, has to upgrade, shouldn't get upgraded too fast. And that one said, people who are living far below their means 
enjoy a freedom that people busy upgrading their lifestyles just can't fathom. And I think that's very important, like just to not upgrade your lifestyle all the time to maintain your freedom. And it just gives you a freedom of operation. Once you make a little bit of money, you still want to be living like your old self so that just the worry goes away. So don't run out to upgrade that house and lifestyle and all that stuff. Let's say you're going to pay $1,000 an hour. The problem is that when you go into a work lifestyle like that, you don't just suddenly go from making $20 an hour to making $1,000 an hour. That's a progression over a long career. And as that happens, one subtle problem is that you upgrade your lifestyle as you make more and more money. And that upgrading of the lifestyle ups what you consider to be wealth, and you stay in this wage slave trap. So I forget who said it, maybe it was Nassim Taleb, but he said, you know, the most dangerous things are heroin and a monthly salary, right? Because they're highly addictive. The way you want to get wealthy is you want to be poor and working and working and working. And this is, for example, how the tech industry works, where you don't make any money for 10 years. And then suddenly in year 11, you might have a giant payday, which is, by the way, one reason why these very high marginal tax rates for the so-called wealthy are flawed, because the highest risk taking, most creative professions literally lose money for a decade of your life while you take massive risk and you bleed and bleed and bleed. And then suddenly in year 11 or year 15, you might have one single big payday. But then, of course, Uncle Sam show up and say, hey, you know what? You just made a lot of money this year. Therefore, you're rich. Therefore, you're evil. And you got to hand it all over to us. So it just destroys those kinds of creative risk-taking professions. But ideally, you want to make your money in discrete lumps separated over long periods of time so that your own lifestyle does not have a chance to adapt quickly. And then you can say, "Okay, now I'm done. Now I'm retired. Now I'm free. I'm still going to work because you got to do something with your life, but I'm going to work on only the things that I want when I want. And it's going to be much more creative expression and much less about money. You're not going to get rich renting out your time, but you say that you will get rich by giving society what it wants, but does not yet know how to get at scale. That's right. So essentially, as we talked about before, money is IOUs from society saying you did something good in the past. Now, here's something that we owe you for the future. And so society will pay you for creating things that it wants. But society doesn't yet know how to create those things, because if it did, it would need you. They would already be stamped out big time. Almost everything in your house, in your workplace and on the street used to be technology at one point in time. There was a time when oil was technology that made J.D. Rockefeller rich. There was a time when cars were technology that made Henry Ford rich. So technology is just a set of things, as Alan Kay said, that don't quite work yet. Once something works, it's no longer technology. So society always wants new things. And if you want to be wealthy, you want to figure out which one of those things you can provide for society that it does not yet know how to get, but it will want that's natural to you and within your skill set, within your capabilities. And then you have to figure out how to scale it. Because if you just build one of it, that's not enough. You've got to build thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of them. So everybody can have one. Steve Jobs and his team, of course, figured out that society would want smartphones, computer in their pocket that had all the phone capability times 100 and be easy to use. So they figured out how to build that. And then they figured out how to scale it. And then they figured out how to get one into every first world citizen's pocket and eventually every third world citizen too. And so because of that, they're handsomely rewarded, and Apple is the most valuable company in the world. 